Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing well. We are in Warm Springs, Georgia, to bring you to a pretty unique place that I think you're really going to enjoy. Lori is with me as always. But before we do anything, it's a no drone zone. So the drone is going to have to stay in the car. We are at Roosevelt's Little White House. Yes, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States, lived here at Warm Springs, Georgia for much of the last 20 years of his life. He got here as much as possible. He visited here actually 41 times. He first started coming in the 20s to relax in the Warm Springs because he was hoping for some relief from the effects of polio. And I think you're really gonna enjoy this museum and the little White House itself. So there's a video that they're gonna show. It's about 20 minutes long and they're getting ready to set that up. So we thought we would look around the front part of the museum here. I don't know if you're like me. I had remembered something about Warm Springs, especially because they did a movie about Warm Springs that Bill Murray played FDR, but I had no idea how close he was with this area, how much he loved its people, and really considered this home towards the end of his life. It didn't cure him, but the waters brought him a lot of comfort. I really thought this was very unique. One of the guides pointed out the fact that it's a much smaller looking wheelchair and a more makeshift looking one. And he said the reason for that is because they actually did design it out of one of his favorite chairs. The arms would come off and this was much smaller than a traditional wheelchair because it was meant to go in and out of an elevator, a lift. And it's one of the first things you see. Really cool. Of course, our next stop is that 20-minute video. I highly suggest you watch it when you come in. Very informative. Now we're in the main part of the museum. The museum sets off in another building from the little White House that we'll see in just a minute. So virtually all the artifacts that the Roosevelts had here during his time that he stayed in Warm Springs is meticulously cataloged and protected here at the museum you get a good sense of what life was like for them in Georgia, how much he loved the citizens of Georgia, how much he loved people be getting treatment here the same way he was. This is an example of an item that was given to the president during his time in office. The craftsmanship that went into this to me is really amazing. Now here, this is really cool. You'll hear me say that a lot. The president's car collection alone is really interesting, but the way in which he drove his cars he designed this ability to control all the workings of the cars from his hands because he clearly did not have the best use of his lower extremities. He was able to control everything using his hands, and he invented that, and it's right here on display. There's such a great mix of things here at this museum, not only more examples here of gifts that were given to the president, from not only across the globe, but across the United States, also right here in Georgia. Some examples of the behind the scenes, seeing the masters at work as they were creating their masterpiece. We also see everyday items like this saddle. We'll see more of uh, personal items, grooming items, hats that FDR wore, his massive walking cane collection. We see examples here of maybe what FDR is most known for, his fireside chats. It was very important to Franklin Roosevelt that he be able to go directly to the American public. There was no better way to talk to the American public than via the radio. And he very much believed in the power of speaking directly to his constituents. We see more examples of some of the everyday items that Franklin Roosevelt had in his home, his hats, of course. Now, this right here, a lot of people don't associate the NRA with a Democratic president. But President Roosevelt was an avid hunter, had a wonderful relationship with the NRA, and was often honored by the NRA for his dedication to the United States Second Amendment. We see some of the examples of the great joy that President Roosevelt had from music. These are some of the musical instruments from the various staff and also from people in the area that would come and play for the Roosevelts. That happened every weekend when they were here visiting. 
President Roosevelt would often talk to the people of Georgia and find out what they needed. He would talk to the farmers. He would talk to the merchants in town. And he knew that the electric grid was something that was solely lacking in these rural communities. And that was a, an important piece of legislation that was actually part of the socioeconomic packages that were passed to help move the country out of the Great Depression. This was an important piece often overlooked, is strengthening the electric grid across the United States, making sure that more and more rural customers had access to electricity. We see specific items now related to World War II. This particular sculpture here was that of an 18-year-old who was executed by the Nazis, an 18-year-old metal worker fighting for his freedom and the important cause of freedom that was going around the world that was trying to be stamped out by the Nazi regime. We see here a picture of the stagecoach that would ferry people around the Warm Springs area when it was a spa and retreat similar to the rehabilitation center that it would become when the president would come in and purchase it. He was told about this area by a friend of his and that it had uh, either closed or was about to close as a resort and the president was able to come in and purchase it. Well, when he did purchase it, one of the things that the area came with was the stagecoach that you see in the picture here, the people mover of its time. And we see that it is right here in the museum in all its glory. It has been redone, but outside of the cosmetic, structurally, the coach was in very good condition when the Roosevelt's actually purchased the area. And uh, it was even used for a little bit to still move people back and forth. It's pretty cool to see this coach. It was built sometime in the mid-1800s on display. We see more portraits and some of the lithographs in the collection that were done of the president. And now we see something that meant a great deal to him. The president really popularized stamp collecting. You know, it was a big hobby, but his level of involvement in the hobby, in the collector circles that would form up around stamp collecting, was really huge. They have honored the president with a great number of stamps, and you see some of his tools in the trade. He took it very seriously. This was something my dad used to do in his youth be a, a stamp collector. It was something I, I never really got into. I bought some of the commemorative sheets that would come out from the post office and still do today, but never got into it to this level. And uh, President Roosevelt had an extensive collection. Stamp collecting mostly reached its peak around the mid 20th century when it was said one in seven families actually had a stamp collection. I almost passed by this display, and I'm glad I didn't. It had some uh, cool pictures of the president, but also down here in this bottom right-hand corner of the display case is said uh, what was his favorite hat. So I thought of all the different hats and things that they have for display, this one was said to be his favorite. Pretty cool. I spent a lot of time just looking at amazement at this walking cane collection, each one so intricate, each one so different from all across the world and also Native American nations within the United States, the Muscogee Creek, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, you had from all over Asia, you have from all over the United Kingdom, right here in Georgia, all across the United States. Very impressive. And you could tell the care that went into each and every one of them. Speaking of care, there was also just a small exhibit to Eleanor Roosevelt but you could tell the love that they both shared, the truly a partnership that they both shared. And this was a handcrafted sweater and hat that was given to the First Lady. And now we're out behind the museum, getting ready to go up to the next section. And then of course, the little White House itself. It's not too hot, I'm glad. Lots of nice places to sit and reflect with family. This is a really cool one. We see all the flags of the United States that were represented during the time that FDR was president. So we're talking 48 states 
that made up the United States at that time. And most everywhere here is going to be accessible by those that are in wheelchairs. Obviously, the president was. The only exceptions to that is getting in some of the servants' quarters that uh, took care of the president while he was here. You would have to go up steps, and there's, there's no way to do that. But other than that, pretty much accessible to everybody. So as we make our way up to the next spot, which is the little White House itself, I'm going to give you a few seconds just to listen to nature. So this is really cool. So we have the sniper posts that were guarding the president. We have the Marine Corps sniper stationed here to the left. And then on the right side, you had a representative of the Secret Service. And I'm sure that is the people that you could see. <laughs> I would say there was a sizable number of agents guarding the president at all times. The first buildings that we'll come to before we get to the little White House is that of the servants' quarters, but really they were the personal staff. So you had Miss Lizzie McDuffie, the personal housekeeper of the President and First Lady, and uh, Miss Bonner, who was the cook. And then you had a very close personal friend of President Roosevelt. Uh, he called him his indispensable valet, Mr. Irvin McDuffie. And Irvin died shortly after the president did. And they were very close uh, for a long time. And he really considered Irvin quite the confidant. So let's make our way on in. Wasn't a huge crowd when we first got here, but the people are really starting to come in. Now, as we go into the McDuffie's home, so Irvin and Miss Lizzie would be here. Nice accommodations, cozy, nothing fancy. This was to keep them close to the president, obviously. And they could get up to him at a, at a moment's notice. You also had the cook, Miss Bonnie's home. And again, kept much as it was back in the mid-40s when they would have last used it. And now on to the Little White House. President Roosevelt would visit here in Warm Springs 41 times, and this is where he would stay. And now we go into the well-stocked and well-maintained kitchen that was overseen by Miss Daisy Bonner. Miss Bonner fixed the very first meal that the president had here, and she fixed the very last meal. She was here as his personal cook for 20 years at Warm Springs. And uh, she herself, unfortunately, didn't live a very long life. She passed away at the age of 55 in 1958. But she had fond recollections of her time here at the Little White House. And the president would rave about her cooking. The Little White House is just as it was back in April the 12th of 1944 when FDR would pass away here, where he was actually sitting for a portrait. That portrait, which remains to this day incomplete, we'll see that here in just a little bit. But the president had just won an unprecedented fourth term, but was in very poor health. He had various heart ailments. He had bronchitis people that had seen him speak, and there's never really been an order, I think, quite like FDR. It's amazing to hear one of his speeches, but in those speeches leading up to his death, he looked haggard, he looked weak, and many did not feel that he would serve out that final term. 
but he took great solace from this place. He loved the people of Georgia and, of course, the warm springs that would bring him here in the first place. And now we go into the bedroom of FDR. This was a place to get away from the trappings, the busyness of the world. He would write many a correspondence from this very desk to friends, to family, to world leaders. He penned several letters to Winston Churchill from here. And this bed is the bed that he would be brought to after he had collapsed from what they would later find out to be a cerebral hemorrhage. And despite the efforts of the local physicians, his own personal physician, the president could not be brought back. Now this is the bedroom of the first lady. Now she would seldom accompany him to Warm Springs, but often his children would and they would sleep in that bedroom. And now we see one of the final areas, a, a sitting room for the president. We see some linen, some washcloths there in the small closet. What a great view. And of course we see one of the president's wheelchairs here where he would retire to in the evening. Lots of light. They wanted light to flow from all different directions into the home. And now the final section of the museum where it touches on several of the articles of the time that were reflecting on the life of President Roosevelt, how sad the country was in losing him. This was a president who had been president for longer than any other in our nation's history and may have just kept on winning elections <laughs> as long as he could. And in fact, of course, he held office as long as he could, literally to the point that he passed away. But for many Americans, and there was a lot of his policies I didn't agree with, but many Americans felt that he was a true president for everyone. And it meant a great deal to many people, the things that he stood for. And now we see that portrait that he was sitting for, this one right here, when he collapsed, was taken to the bed in the home and would later pass away. But the unfinished portrait, the final portrait of Franklin Delano Roosevelt Thanks everybody so much for watching. If you haven't, please subscribe and let me know in the comment sections any other types of content you would like to see. Have a great day, everybody.